Hello. Um, hi, everybody. I'm just going to take a few minutes here and get set up. Um, I hope you can hear me. If anyone can't hear me, please let me know. Um, I'm using a headset because I don't trust my my um, webcam. So let me just try posting something. I um, hope you can see me. Um, OK, so I'm going to be talking today about how to end war. Um, and before I do that, I want to just I want to first start talking about what I'm what I'm not talking about. Um, what I'm not talking about is, or what I, what I'm not trying to do is um, to talk about ending violence. Um, I want to first make the distinction between war and violence, and um, I also want to make sure that you guys can hear me. So, thank you, Press for Freedom. Thanks. OK, good. I was a little concerned about that. OK, so um, my topic is how to end war. And um, this should be a really short talk, because basically what I'm going to do is make a few what I think are really simple distinctions. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about what war is, what it's not. Um, how war is different from violence, um, from, from just plain violence. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of frustration about what to do to combat war. There's a lot of frustration in the anti-war movement, whether the anti-war left um, or the libertarian anti-war movement, um, and even the conservative anti-war movement, which what's possibly starting to become one. Um, George Donnelly, who um, who is sort of who, who set this up, and thank you very much, George. Um, I was listening to Angela Keaton talk earlier today, and George had a question. He asked, he, he sort of voiced his frustration, saying, the anti-war things feel like the anti-TSA thing, hopeless. No idea where to start. Where do I start? Um, that's what I'm here to talk about today, is where do we start? And I say where we start is attacking the lies that are at the root of what allows war to continue, the lies that we, that most of us just embody, most of us just um, accept without question. They're a part of our culture. They're a part of, of what everybody just believes to be, to be just how things are. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about is, is what those lies are. Um, to talk about ending war is to risk sounding naive. Um, nobody who wants to be taken seriously comes out and says that all war is bad, right? I mean, that's just, you don't say that. You, you have to qualify it. You have to say, you know, well, this war is bad. You know, the George Bush's wars were bad, um, or Obama's wars are bad, or, you know, this one makes sense. That one doesn't make sense. This was justified. This wasn't justified. Um, I'm taking the position that no war is ever justified. Um, and that's, it's both a radical position, and it's also, it's, it's a position that um, puts you at risk of just not being taken seriously. Because, again, one of those, one of those lies that, that we believe as, as society, that most of us believe, one of those lies is that war is just inevitable. It's just something we have to live with. It's something that is unfortunate, that we really try hard to avoid. You know, our leaders really don't want it, but they, they try to, they try to, they try everything else first. They try to avoid it, but sometimes it's just the last. You know, we have to do it, and um, and that's pretty much what people believe. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, ta I'm taking the position that all war is is unjustified. There's there's never a justification for war. Um, in order to do that, we need to sort of make a distinction between war and violence. And um, another one of those beliefs is that. If you oppose all war, that makes you a pacifist. That means you have to be a pacifist. Well, I'm not a pacifist. I know there are people who oppose all war who are pacifists, and um, I'm not a pacifist. I, th I think sometimes violence is justified. I think you know violence and self-defense is absolutely justified. Um, the, con the confusion is. We tend to, we tend to sort of extrapolate. We say we say that um, you know okay if you say violence is justified if you say violence is justified in self defense well therefore a war in self defense is is justified and we kind of it's it's um we kind of extrapolate human relations to state relations and I know states are made up of human beings I'm not saying they're not but it's not the same thing to say that 
you know, a, a person or a family can defend themselves and a nation can defend itself because they're not, they're just not the same thing. Um, when a nation goes to war with another nation, it's essentially the government and the military of that nation going to war with the civilians of another nation. So we're, we're talking about two sort of separate classes, two, two different entities. Um, and I think that's what kind of gets lost in, in discussions about war. We sort of, most people sort of say, well, you know, this nation, nation X aggressed against nation Y, therefore nation Y has, has you know, the right to, to respond with aggression against Nation X. Um, but we don't really break down what nation means. You know, who, who was it that did the aggressing? Was it, was it really the civilians of Nation X that came over and attacked the civilians of Nation Y? Um, or was it the military and the government that came over and attacked Nation Y? So that's kind of the first distinction to make. That, and I think it kind of gets to the heart of these lies that, um, that I say are, are at the heart of, of why we allow um, you know, why, why we as, as a society, as, as humanity, allow war to continue. And that is we don't distinguish between, between governments and people. And I know this is obvious to most people listening probably that, you know, the people of a nation are not the government and blah, blah, blah. But most of us, 90% of us out there act as if they are, act as if it's the same thing. Well, it's not the same thing. Um, and that's kind of, that's, that's part of why when you think when you think war through when you think through what it is we're talking about you know we're not talking about responding you know we're not talking about overthrowing a dictator we're not talking about you know responding in kind to violence we're talking about using brute force against civilians in response to something that a nation state has done and i think if people could just get that one distinction i think that would that would really clear things up a lot i think i think um I think if if people could see that war is a separate a separate thing from violence it's not just it's not it's not you know some guy hitting somebody else in a bar it's not um you know some it's not you know your your it's not it's not your civilian criminal behavior it's not somebody murdering somebody it's not it's not you know someone just you know, breaking into someone's house and killing them or hurting them—it's—it's it's a totally different animal, and it's certainly not to to sort of use the the revenge um, analogy to try to apply that to war really doesn't make sense. Um, so that's the first point I want to make. Um, the second point, the second distinction, the thing thing that separates war from other forms of violence, um, whether justified or non, not justified, is in our society we have. Um, in theory, we have ways of dealing with violence. We have ways, and believe me, I'm, no, I'm not defending the police state here. I'm not defending what we have as, as an existing police state. But traditionally, we've had, um, you know, we've had rules and laws and social norms against harming each other. And there are consequences for doing that. There are consequences for harming, for harming another person. Um, Again, in theory, and I understand it doesn't work very well. And I think the reason it doesn't work very well is related to what I'm talking about. Um, with war, we really don't have that. We don't have a system for holding war makers accountable. And part of that is because we, you know, we look at it as well. It's not. I, I think we have our. We've 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 divided. We've made the wrong divisions. We've divided ourselves into different nations, and we talk about, you know, this was the bad nation, this was the good nation, and you know, these nations were aggressed upon. And we're talking about nation versus nation, when in fact we should talk, be talking about states versus civilians. We should be talking about states versus civilized society. Um, and when you do that, you realize we don't actually. We have a lot of pretenses. We have a lot of efforts, and I, I understand, you know, what the founding fathers were trying to accomplish. But we don't really have um, we don't really have an effective mechanism for restraining the war makers. We don't have, um, you know, we can we can pretend that um, you know that that war tribunals, that, that war crimes tribunals, are that. And I think everybody knows they're not because how many times does the victor actually end up in a war crimes tribunal. They don't. Um, so the, the idea that, I mean, I think, I, again, I think we have a lot of pretenses and we have a lot of, um, you know, liking to imagine that we actually hold our government accountable or that we can hold other governments accountable. Um, and that's, that's just not true. I mean, 
there's there's no there's no third party there's no um there's no outside agency there's there's nothing except you know the governments themselves to hold governments accountable for for war crimes for 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 the evil they do in the name of war um and i think that's just that's obvious from um you know from what from what our own country has done throughout history you know from what our from what our country has done in wartime um you know it's it's everybody has heard this now but you know um Matt Robert McNamara has admitted that what was done and what he assisted with doing in World War II, the firebombing of so many Japanese cities and the nuking of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, would have been considered a war crime had they had we lost the war. And um, you know, I think he's absolutely right. I think there are a lot of things that our government has done that um, you know, and that uh, that other governments who happen to end up as the victors have done that. Um, that would have would should be classified as war crimes um and you know how how do we how do we reconcile that with this pretense that we um that we control our government or that we somehow control um that we could have some limitations on war because we don't you know there's this idea of there's there's just war theory in the Christian tradition and even just war theory is is lacking because you know think about it there are all these conditions for um, you know for how for how war can be fought for for what you can do what you can't do um, and these conditions are, are kind of they're 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 self-enforcing. There's no enforcement mechanism. So you know you're it, it, the, the purpose of just war theory is to make sure that war is only waged when it really has to be when it's when it's really justified um, and that um, that civilian casualties are kept to a minimum. That they're that they're you know that the civilians are only killed when it's really unavoidable and when you absolutely have to do it in order to achieve some you know some larger military goal um and even that to, you know to my mind well it's still a crime i mean you know if i had to if i were trying to save someone's life let's say or you know trying to save many people's lives and the only way to do it i mean this is always it always comes down to these absurd hypotheticals um right where you know, you have the only way to save hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians is to kill all these other innocent civilians over here. Um, so, in order to justify war, you kind of have to buy into that hypothetical. Um, let me just stop for a second because I think my chat just went. Um, is anybody else on chat? Can anybody see me? Let's just see. Um, so, Let's see what happens there. Um, and please feel free to post questions and challenges and arguments if, if um, you don't like what I'm saying or if you um, have a question or if you disagree. And I'm worried that I can't see anybody on chat now. I saw you guys and now you're not there. So i um, not sure what's going on with that, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, so so this whole the whole um, just war theory, which is you know supposed to set limits on how killing is done and and who gets killed and under what conditions and all that stuff. The problem is there's no there's no enforcement mechanism. There's no there's nothing outside of um, there's nothing outside of the actors themselves. You know it's it's kind of up to them um, or you know back when it was developed I guess the church. But let's not pretend that the church was an outside you know independent third party. Um, there is there's no enforcement mechanism there's nothing there's nothing to hold those entities accountable there's nothing to hold the people who are who are um, making war and who are killing civilians to hold them accountable for their actions so um that's kind of that's the second point i wanted to make about what why is what makes war different why why can we why can we oppose war without opposing all violence i mean i think it's kind of self evident that you can Hi, hi, Kent. Um, <laughs> do you see the chat? Um, 
I think it's, I think it's, um, yes, I do. Yes, I see you. Thanks. There we go. Um, I, it should be, it should be, it should be self-evident that, you know, there's a difference between, um, fighting back when somebody, when another human being, ah, I see, only comments posted to Facebook are visible. Oh, okay, because we're using the Facebook chat. Okay, I knew this was going to be confusing. Um, okay, thanks, thank you, Kent. Um, so I just, I hope people can figure that out and go to Facebook and do what you need to do. Um, but um, anyway, yes, again, please feel free to post questions. And, and also, um, what I'm kind of trying to do is go through some of the lies that I think are at the heart of why we as a society, we as humanity, allow war to continue. Um, if I've left any out, I mean, I don't pretend that this is exhaustive by any means. Um, if I've left anything out or if anybody else has any, any other lies or any other, any other sort of um, bad ideas, uh, misunderstandings, I think, again, I think it's, it's sort of a fundamental misunderstanding about what war is. Um, Thanks, George, about what war is, about what nations are, about what human beings are, what human beings are as opposed to what states and organizations are. Um, I think it's some very, very fundamental um, misunderstandings about some very fundamental ideas, I, is what I'm saying, that are at the root of this. Um, so what I'm kind of getting at is, let me just step back for a second. Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers for ending war, so if, if you came here thinking that I was going to give you a full game plan, um, I'll give you your money back. Um, what I'm presenting here are the issues we need to deal with if we're going to have a chance of ending war. Um, we've got we've to address these absurd beliefs that most of us hold, and most of us, you know, to be honest, most of us just haven't thought about. I mean, a few years ago, I hadn't thought about it. So, you know, I don't pretend that this should be obvious to everyone. It seems obvious now. You know, I'm sure it seems obvious to a lot of you all listening. But I think most people don't think about these things in much depth. I think, um, you know, and I think that's partly by design. I think that has a lot to do with our education system. Um, and <laughs> I'll do that, Kent. Um, and so I'm just kind of trying to point out some of the some of the distinctions that I've found and some of the the lies that are kind of at the heart of why we allow so much violence in our in what is supposedly civilization, what's supposed to be civilized society. So um, so the first thing I've done is sort of made a distinction between war and violence. You know, we talk about them as if they're the same thing. They're not. There's sort of a predominant belief out there that, you know, when you ask people, what do we need to do to end war? People will say, oh, gosh, you know, wouldn't that be nice? But, you know, as long as people are as screwed up and violent and horrible as we are, you know, until we, until we change human nature, essentially, until we all become enlightened um, or enough of us become enlightened, we're going to keep on having wars. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think that's, that's a tremendous mistake to make, to think that wars are a product of our collective psyche, of our collective badness, our collective um, will to aggression and will to violence. Um, sure, it's true. If everybody, or even I'd say if even 90% of the people out there became enlightened, became nonviolent, stopped believing in aggression, and decided, you know, decided to, to live differently, then probably, yeah, war would end. Um, the problem with that, though, is, you know, number one, I'm not, I mean, I'm all for becoming enlightened, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not going to sit around and wait for everyone else to become enlightened before we can have peace. And I also think it's just flat out wrong to think that that's necessary. I think what's at the root of the violence in our society now is not bad human nature, it's bad institutions. It's bad systems. We have systems set up that allow violence. We have systems set up that reward violence. And if we don't address that, if that's not if that's not what we're looking at, if we're just looking at fixing human nature and trying to make all of us perfect, I just don't think that's going to get us anywhere. Um, let 
we often hear this. We, I mean, we, we hear this all the time that, and this gets back to my original point about, you know, coming off as sounding naive if you oppose all war. If you, if you try and say, you know, no war is ever justified, well, no one's going to take you seriously because in their minds, some war is always justified, right? I mean, it's sometimes, oh, some, you know, a country will do a really bad thing. They'll invade somebody. Um, they'll invade another country. You know, that's bad, right? We should, we should respond to that, right? And they're missing the point. They're missing the first distinction I made. They're missing, you know, a couple of distinctions about, you know, civilian versus, versus the state. Um, but I think the larger point is, the, the larger point about war is that it's completely, it's completely unaccountable. And that's what I mean by systems. So the, the specific systems I'm talking about are systems that grant to one body, to one entity, and in this case, let's call it the war-making state, systems that grant, our, our system right now, the system we live in, whether it's, you know, the official system or whether it's just what's, what's sort of evolved is that We've carved out this special status both for the state, for, for governments, and also for war itself. We have, there are special rules for war. You know, um, people like to say war is hell. Anything goes in war. And, you know, we, again, we have this pretense of, well, no, there are rules. And, you know, when people do really atrocious things, you know, even Americans, they're going to they're gonna get held accountable. And, you know, there are a few little showcases like the, the Afghanistan kill team, if you've been following that atrocity. Um, you know, they're, I think they're going to hold a few people somewhat accountable. Um, any bets on whether they get the death penalty? I, I doubt it. Um, they're going to make a show of holding those people accountable because they did something truly atrocious and they were caught doing it. There, there's, you know, evidence showing that they did it. Just like Abu Ghraib, you know, there's evidence. They took pictures of themselves. So, um, you know, they, they do, I think they do make an effort at, at giving us this pretense of accountability. I think anyone who who has anyone who's familiar with war at all understands, and and you know, for God's sakes, I mean, just look at the newspapers, just look at look at all of the atrocities that go unpunished. I mean, the norm in war is inflicting atrocities on people, um, and we've carved out this special status. It's like, well, that's war. It's hell, and it's okay. That's just that's just what they do. Um, that's that's. That's the system I'm talking about. That's, that's part of the system I'm talking about. That's this, you know, we have different rules for the situation called war, and we have different rules for this entity called the state. Um, it's not subject to the same rules we are. You know, look at all the, look at the police abuses. Look at the things that the police are doing. I mean, you know, Troy Davis was just executed um, for a crime. And I, I don't know if he was guilty. I don't know if he was innocent. What I'm pretty certain about is that neither did neither did the, did the people who executed him, and that's you know a condemnation of our justice system. We're willing to execute somebody on very flimsy evidence, um, you know, who who may or may not be guilty of having killed, you know, an a, an actor for the state. But at the same time, you know, you can read um, read Pro Liberate, you know, Will Griggs' blog, um, read Cop Block. They're one of the best. I'm just gonna post cop block because they're great. Um, go check out check out cop block site. Check out Will Grigg. Um, it seems to be daily now. I mean, it's at least weekly. But ho you know, horrific things that the police get away with that you know the rest of us we'd be facing the death penalty. So um, I'm not even going to go into them because it just it turns my stomach to even talk about some of the stuff that happens. But my point is. This is this is the system I'm talking about. This is it's it's this system of one group of people gets different rules. One group of people doesn't have to follow the most fundamental rules of our society, which is you don't kill each other. You know that's the most fundamental thing we've got going for us. That's if if society has anything binding it, if there's anything, if there's any glue, if there's anything that holds us together that makes us civilized, it's that you don't get to kill each other. There are consequences for that. Um, and, but the fact of the matter is, we have set aside certain groups of people, certain institutions, and certain situations, namely war, where you don't really have to follow those rules. Oh, these people don't, they don't, they don't have to do that. They're, it was in the line of duty, so, you know, we've got to cut him some slack. And, yeah, I know he beat that guy to death, and he was just sitting on the pavement, but that's, you know, he's, he was working off aggression or something. Um, 
So that's, I think that's, that's kind of at the heart of what I'm talking about. That's what I mean by the systems, by the institutions that, that we've created, um, that we live with it, that it's like, it's the water, it's the water we swim in. You know, it's, for most people, they don't even question it. For most people, it's just, oh yeah, you know, police are different, um, war is different, the military is different. Um, and what I'm saying to y to y'all who are interested in stopping war, um, which I think is doable, what needs to be addressed is this systemic inequality of of consequences, this systemic lack of accountability for certain actors. So. I don't think it's true that we need to change the hearts and minds of the majority of, of people living in our society before we can have a civilized society. I think we need to have a system where people who aggress against other people face consequences. And that's precisely what we don't have. You know, if you're the right person, if you're in the right agency, the right group of other people, you don't face consequences. Um, so what I'm saying is we need, we need to change the systems, not change the people. Um, that's that's kind of my point. Um, again, I don't think you have to be a pacifist to oppose war. Um, I know some people are, and I respect that. And there are also different definitions of pacifism floating around. I think some people think pacifism means violence and self-defense is OK. Some people don't. Um, I don't consider myself a pacifist just because I think violence and self-defense is okay. I think it's I think it's justified. I think you try to avoid it. Um, actually, I asked a, a Buddhist teacher about this once. Um, you know, what do you do when if if somebody is um, somebody is aggressing against yourself or against somebody else, and you're right there? You know, do you just let them? Do you just do you just let somebody you know stab somebody right in front of you? And I, I loved his answer. He said. Um, you know, you do you do intervene. You do try to intervene. You try to prevent that, but you do it as if it's your mother who's the aggressor. You do it as if your mother has gone crazy. She's on drugs. She's nuts. Whatever. She's wielding this knife and she's coming at you. And of course, you're going to stop her. But are you going to throw her to the ground and beat her to death? Are you going to you know taser her until she can't move? I mean, it was just I, I loved his answer. I just that's kind of off topic. Not. What I was here to talk about, but um, but I just I love that answer that um, you know violence doesn't have to be even justified violence doesn't have to be the kind of violence that we see today. Um, so how do we end war? Um, we combat the lies that support it. We combat the lies that you know that. That it's justified, that it's ever that it's ever okay to murder innocent civilians in response to what a government has done. Um, that's one lie. Um, that war and violence are the same thing. They're not the same thing, and you need to understand what the difference is if you're going to really address the heart of the problem. Um, and I, and I think most people don't. I think most people don't, don't haven't thought about it. Um, another lie. And this is especially strong in democracies. I think it's I think it's being challenged a little bit more now, um, kind of given where we are in America and what's what's going on here. But the lie that governments represent the people they govern, um, and it's really easy to believe that in a democracy because oh, I went down and I voted, so that's my representative, and he does what I want. And um, you know, look at the look at the bailout vote if you want you know, if you want some hard evidence for for how well that works. Look at the look at the bailout vote where they initially voted not not to go through with it, and then were pressured by the people who really rule the country, and they turned around and voted for it um, despite hundreds of thousands of faxes from American people saying they didn't want it. Um, I mean, if you really think if you really think that our government's working for us, um, I think you need to look a little more closely, um, and I think that's true of government governments everywhere. I mean, I think some some are, I think there are shades of gray. Some are a little bit more responsive than others. But when it comes to their real interests, when it comes to you know them being really threatened, who are they going to choose? Are they going to choose you, or are they going to choose the entities and the, the, the businesses and the cronies who are supporting them? Um, are they going to choose their own interests, or are they going to choose your interests? And I think the biggest lie is to believe that those interests are aligned. Um, not saying they never. I'm not saying there's never any overlap. There is sometimes some overlap. And and again, us 
the American people, well, that's not really one entity either, is it? It's, we're disparate. We all we have different um, from different income groups, different races, different classes, different interests, different philosophies, different ideals. You know, to say that the American people, you know, want X is also a little misleading. But I think more fundamentally, to believe that that we can equate our government with us because, you know, with me or with you or with all of us, because, you know, we vote for representatives, I think is a, you know, talk about naive. I think that's a little bit naive. Um, so that's a big lie. That's a big lie to combat. Um, and one of the consequences of that particular lie where we, where we pretend that our government is responsive to us, is, is responsible to us, does what we want it to do, that we are somehow, that we somehow control it. Um, one of the consequences, which is a particularly evil one, I think, is that we then impute that belief onto other people when we say, well, you know, those, those people in Iraq or whatever, you know, hate country of, of the month, of, of the year, whatever country we're told to hate, those, those people, you know, those people in Iraq, well, they should have overthrown Saddam. They, you know, they're guilty because they live under this evil dictator, and so therefore it's okay to kill them too. And people really believe this. I mean, people were saying this. I remember as, as the Iraq war was, was imminent, um, you heard this. You heard this from people that, you know, well, those people should have done something about him. They should have, they should have gotten rid of him. Um, and, you know, kind of to turn it around, if you really believe that, then you've kind of just justified the terrorist acts on 9-11, right? Because we should have stopped our governments from interfering overseas. We should have stopped our, our government from, from, you know, having troops in Saudi Arabia, from imposing sanctions on Iraq that killed over, uh, over half a million Iraqi children. You know, if we really control our government, we should have done that. And therefore, we deserve to have, you know, buildings blown up and, and you know, airplanes flown into our buildings, which, of course, we don't. You know, nobody does. No, no civilian deserves that. Um, but you can't really, you can't really make both arguments. You can't say that the people living under an evil dictator are responsible. You know, should have overthrown him. Um, and if they don't, they deserve to die. But the terrorists on 9/11 were, you know, not justified in their actions. And of course, just in case anyone's confused, I'm not saying they were justified. They clearly were not. It was, it was an evil act of aggression, just like our government's acts are evil acts of aggression. Um, so that's kind of that's sort of a corollary or a, a spin-off from you know believing that believing that we can be equated with our governments, believing that our governments represent us or that we in some way control our governments. Um, it's often turned into you know a very um, it's it's often turned around against against other people in a way that justifies murdering civilians in other countries. So um, again, I think that's kind of that's that is also at the heart of of um, what allows what allows war to persist. Um, and really, I mean, I have my own ideas about what what a better society would look like. Um, I don't think I even need to. It doesn't have to be the way I say it's going to be. I mean, I, I have my ideas. I don't pretend to be the authority on that. I don't pretend that my way is the only way it can work. Um, but I do think that if we don't, if we don't address this fundamental issue of accountability, um, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, my, my idea is that as long as we have a monopoly on violence, as long as you grant one entity a monopoly, to determine what the law is, to enforce the law, of course you're going to have problems. Of course, of course, it's going to act in its own interest. Of course, you know, who who do you go to when that entity fails you? Who do you go to when that? And I understand about checks and balances, and that you know, I've seen how well that works, and I think the rest of us have too. Um, I think that's at the center of it. I think if we don't address the monopoly on the use of force. And I'm not saying there aren't other things we can address too, but to my mind, that's sort of, that's central. That's, you know, if we don't address that, we're going to keep having this problem. We're going to keep having war. We're going to ha keep having, you know, aggression that goes unpunished. We're going to keep having, 
you know, police forces that, that just run rampant and taser people and, and TSA screenings and all the stuff that we're always complaining about, we're going to keep having that if we don't address the monopoly on force. Um, and again, I don't want to pretend that my way of addressing it or my solution to that is the only way. I would just like to get people to recognize that that's kind of the central problem we've got to deal with and let's let's start talking about it. Let's let's at least start start addressing that because that is that's at the heart of it. Um, you know sort of a, a sub a sub point I kind of wanted to make is that the people the people who suffer the effects of war, the ones the victims and again this is is very is so obvious, but it's tied to what to what I'm saying about the monopoly on force. The the people who are the victims of war really don't have a voice in in making the decisions about war. They don't have a voice in you know whether the U.S. government's going to go to war, go and invade um, Iraq or Afghanistan, or how many bombs are going to be dropped, or where they they're 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 completely they're completely voiceless. Um, and that's essentially because we've carved out this special, we have this special stra status for the people who make war, the people who, who are charged with inflicting violence, um, you know, supposedly for good. Um, we've given them this special status and there's nobody to check them. There's nobody in real life, not in theory, not in, not in high school textbooks, but in real life, there's nothing to check them. And that's the fundamental problem. That's what we need to address. Um, the other thing, and again, this is a side issue. I did not come on here to talk about the Fed or central banking or anything like that. But what would be huge would be if, uh, you know, Angela was talking about talking to the anti-war left. And I wish I'd brought this up in chat. Um, when I was watching her, um, what would be huge would be to get the anti-war left to understand the connection between centralized banking and war, and to understand how government manipulates money, how it has historically, you know, democratic government or non-democratic government, how it has historically manipulated money, devalued money in order to benefit itself, in order to sort of to, to sap the value, to sap the wealth from society and use it for its own purposes. So if you know, if you don't understand how that works, if you don't understand how inflating the money supply brings in basically brings in money for those at the top, and by those at the top, I mean I mean the government, their contractors, everyone who's paid initially by the government, and that's all you know, military, whatever the government is spending money on, they get their money at full value. The rest of us, when it trickles down, it's then been devalued, and that's how they sap wealth from productive society, from you know, from real people re with real lives, and bring it into the war machine. That's that's how it's been. That's how it's happened historically. That's how it's happening right now. And I think it would just be huge if you know if we could. And I know a lot of people are taking on this issue, but whatever there is of the anti-war left, if we could get them to understand this one point, um, I just think that would be huge. I, that's, that's my little bandwagon. I would, I would love to do that. Um, what won't work to end war? Um, I've spent a lot of time, as I'm sure a lot of you guys have, um, going to protests, signing petitions, um, talking to people, having conversations, all that kind of thing. And, um, I've come away from it just feeling very. Um, first of all, I will never. I will, I, one thing I want is I will never take my children to a protest um, after seeing what the New York police did in um, O three, right? O three. Um, you know, I will. I will never, never do that. Not in this country. Um, but I came away from it feeling very despondent, very hopeless, and kind of to echo George's point from early on about just feeling really frustrated, like, what do we do? You know, I've been in marches where there were estimated at least 100,000 marchers, probably more, um, and it accomplished nothing. You know, a few weeks later, the U.S. government invaded Iraq. So you come away from it feeling very hopeless um, or very purposeless. You know, put this all this effort into into something and... and Nothing. So, what doesn't work? Um, I don't think it works to petition the war makers to end war. I just think that's kind of like, you know, petitioning a serial killer to stop killing. It's you got to look at where their interests lie and 
what, you know, why would they respond to that? Um, does that mean that it never makes sense to protest or to march in the streets? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think it always makes sense to speak out against war. I think the most powerful thing we can do is to continue the conversation about war and to really to change the conversation so that we're, we're dealing with the real issues, um, so that we're actually addressing the root of the problem. Um, so I think I think you know continuing the conversation is great. I think it's it's great to show that we're against war, if only you know if only for our own morale to to recognize that you know we're not alone. That there are a lot of other people out there who who see it our way, or who or at least see this part of it our way and are against war. Um, so I don't think it. I don't, I don't think demonstrations are a bad thing. I just don't think on their own that they're gonna they're gonna end war. I don't think they did in Vietnam. I don't think that's I don't think that's why the Vietnam War ended. I think it ended because the government ran out of money. Um, which is not to say the demonstrations weren't a good thing, didn't and you know, didn't have any impact. Um, so I'm not against demonstrating. I just think if that's your whole plan, um, it's it's not gonna take you very far. Um, Yeah, speaking speaking out against war in whatever form um, is always valuable, and I, I, I actually I think I mean, you know, from my perspective, I, that's that's precisely what we need to be doing. That's that's the main thing because um, the whole problem, as I was trying to say at, at the beginning, the whole problem is that I think people people who are anti-war. Um, have some sort of fundamental misunderstandings or fundamental confusions about what causes war and what's at the heart of war. It's not, it's not that people are bad. It's not that people are violent. It's not that you know. It's not that I have still have too much darkness in my heart. Um, that all might be true. We all we might be you know violent, flawed people. We of course we are. Of course we're flawed, and there are violent people. But that's not the source. That's not the source of um, of why war is able to continue. Um, you know, I think there will always be some violence in our society. I think um, the thing, the, ans the answer is to come up with ways to combat that violence, to have consequences for that violence, to, um, you know, to, f to fight it, not to come up with, s not to carve out special areas where it's allowed. And, and by the way, those special areas start to bleed over into the rest of our society. I mean, you know, Veterans come back, after, you know, Iraq, Iraq veterans right now come back after having been trained to see people as, you know, enemies, as cattle, as, you know, as less than human. They come back and what do they do? They get jobs as, as police officers. And now we're seeing, you know, we're seeing even more. And I'm not saying that's the whole, there, there are a lot of reasons why we're seeing more violence with, with the police. But I think that's part of it. We're, it. It impacts our whole culture. You know, when you, when you legitimize war and warlike behavior, um, it doesn't just stay on the battlefield. It comes back to where we live, and um, you know, just the, con the consequences are, are much wider than just just the war itself. Um, I'm going to wrap up because I wanted. I see there are some questions, and I wanted to get back and get to those. Um, but the point I wanted to make in closing was just that conventional wisdom tells us it's naive to hope for an end to war. It tells us that. You know that's that's not possible. That's just that's dreaming. That's you know that's ridiculous. I say it's naive to set up an entity that has a monopoly on the use of force, the monopoly on making law and making war, and expect that entity to then act in your interests. I say that's naive. Um, so how do we change this? How do we end war? We change the conversation. We talk about the things I've been talking about and. I'm not pretending this is exhaustive. Again, um, I'm sure you guys have some thoughts too. I think you know other people have given this a lot of thought and have come up with other sort of foundational beliefs. But what we do is we get down to those foundational beliefs. We get down to the root beliefs that allow us to believe that war is justified, that it's legitimate, and that it's inevitable. I'm not going to go over all those beliefs again, but you know, it's essentially. We ha we have these these beliefs that we kind of that are inside us almost that are that mo again that most people just don't even question and that's what we need to get at if we're gonna if we have any chance of ending war we need to address that first if we don't if we don't address 
those beliefs, we're just going to keep going around in circles. We're going to have demonstrations. We're going to have a lot of irate people. We're going to have, you know, lots of marches and arrests and all that stuff. And it's just going to, the cycle's going to continue, you know. We'll be here, the next generation will be doing this again. There will be another war. You know, our kids will be marching in demonstrations and, you know, and their kids and their kids after that. And we're just not going to, we're not going to we're not going to get anywhere if we don't address the root causes and the way we do that is through the conversation is by by talking about these things by sort of ferreting out what those root causes are what the the beliefs are and um that's how we start so i'm just going to i'm going to look back through the chat and see what the questions are okay this is a little obnoxious because um okay the so I see Scott's comment. Um, yes, we do have a structural problem more so than a content problem. When you have a defunct framework on which to work, the results of it will often be in a defunct direction. Absolutely. Um, the reason I mentioned that comment is that's the first one I'm seeing. If, so if you posted something before Scott, I'm not seeing it. Could you just repost if you have a question or a comment or something? Um, please repost it because I can only see down to Scott's comment. OK, Kevin. Where are they now? I don't know who you're talking about. Um, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Why pray for peace and pay for war? Yeah. Yeah, Kevin makes a good point. Kevin, you make a good point. The media actually covered the wars then. That's true. We don't see, uh, they, they kind of cover it now, but we don't see what we saw during Vietnam, right? We don't see the, the cadavers and the, you know, the, the bleeding um, victims on, on both sides, you know. Um, we don't see the the screaming soldiers being ca you know with a leg missing or whatever we don't, they're they're very careful to to shield us from that um not that you can't find it in al jazeera you know if you want to seek out al jazeera but for most of the american population they're not seeing that you're absolutely right and um i think that, that and that certainly makes that certainly makes a difference as far as public perception of war um the bigger question though is how do you translate, how do you, how do you turn public perception of war or public opposition to war, how do you translate that into real impact? How do you, how do you translate that into, into ending war? Um, <laughs> okay, just reading these comments. Um, <laughs> we were born with only two natural fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. All other behavior is learned through our conditioned response mechanism. Um, I don't know about that. I, I have no comment. Um, so any other, any questions, any, any comments? Do, does this mean you guys agree with me? Does this mean that um, we're on the same page here? Because um, that'd be great. Um, and again, just to reiterate, kind of what I'm saying is, in order to end war, I think, um, most of the anti-war efforts are kind of are kind of going around in circles a little bit, just because. And when I say going around in circles, I mean like from generation to generation. It's like we're doing the same thing. Those of us who oppose war are doing the same thing that you know the people in the 60s were doing. We're marching. We're demonstrating. We're we're calling. For, uh, we're not doing as much of it. I wish we were, um, but. I don't think they or us have, have really addressed what needs to be addressed. And um, that's just what I'm talking about here is sort of the first step, the foundation. If we don't lay a solid foundation, if we don't really address the root causes and the root beliefs, then we're just going to keep doing that. We're going to keep going in circles. So uh, what does Scott say? We cannot doubt that mainstream media isn't as embedded in and corrupted by the government or major funders of their programming. Independent media is the only way. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, yeah, uh, Kent just posted, self-reliance is discouraged while dependence on the grid is mandated. Yeah, more and more, more so every day, it seems. Um, so many join the military to survive. Yeah, and that's the other thing. I mean, it's kind of a vicious cycle because you know what are they doing they're they're sapping the wealth out of out of society and i mean there's there's this crazy 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 um i'm sorry i hate to tell people who disagree with me crazy but um there's we we've got it wrong we have we we look at most of us look at society as sort of in terms of class warfare um rich versus poor the haves versus the have-nots and 
you know, sure, to some extent, the haves have stuff they shouldn't have. Um, but the real distinction to make is between the people who are actually stealing the wealth from everyone else via fiat currency, via, via inflating the money, and, you know, pulling it into the war machine. That's, that's what they're doing. Um, and the more they do that, the poorer we get, the more poor people there are out here who then have limited options. And, um, and not just the military. I think, you know, I keep seeing these ads on the backs of buses about, you know, join Homeland Security for a bright, shining new career. And it's just creepy. I mean, more and more I'm feeling like I'm in an Orwellian, like I'm in an Orwell movie. You know, it's just the this, this stuff you see out there. Um, and I do think there, you know, there are a lot of people now. There's unemployment is is very high. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of people who have fewer choices, and the war machine just eats them up. Um, Kevin, although I consider anarchist viewpoints my base for our system to work, Ron Paul would be a great start. The educational value alone may swing the masses. Kevin, absolutely. I think I think Ron Paul has done a huge, huge amount. Just in terms, just his education, what he has done to bring the issue of the Fed to the forefront. I mean, can you imagine, you know, six or seven years ago even, um, before the 08 election, can you imagine, you know, hearing about Austrian economics or, you know, talking critically about the Federal Reserve. Can you imagine any of that happening in the mainstream media at all? I mean, and I think he is single-handedly responsible for that. I think he is, deserves tremendous kudos for that. Um, absolutely, he would be a great start. And there is, this is a whole other discussion, but, you know, there are discussions going on between anarchists of different stripes um, about, you know, whether to vote or not. And I actually, back in 08, I wrote, as a, as a long-time non-voter, I wrote about why I was going to vote for Ron Paul. Um, and there's, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of anarchists are, are sort of critical of those of us who support Ron Paul because, you know, that's not the answer. We've got to, we've got to, as I'm saying, address the root of the problem. We've got to address the, the monopoly on force, which if he becomes president, he'll be wielding that monopoly on force. So that's not, that's not the solution. And they're right, but at the same time, having, and, you know, call me a hypocrite for this if you want. That's, I'm fine with that, but... Um, having him as president, ending the wars, um, ending or at least, you know, ending as much as the president has the power to, ending the war on drugs, um, getting a bunch of innocent people out of prison, stopping the killing of men, women, and children overseas, I'm going to do that. I mean, no, I don't expect it to answer all, the, all of the questions. I don't expect that to, to be our big solution. Um, it does. It does. It doesn't address the the issues. I mean, other than the Fed, other than you know, if he were to abolish the Fed, that would somewhat address what I'm talking about. So my support for Ron Paul, and I didn't mean this to be a Ron Paul um, presentation, but my support for Ron Paul is not because I think he's the end all be all. He's gonna an he's gonna solve everything. He's gonna fix everything. But if he were to become president, um, a lot of innocent lives would be so would be saved, and that's that's good enough for me. So um, let's see what else we have. Uh, Ken Gillespie, I feel that only people with experience in the military have an understanding of how brutal and aggressive our military culture is, especially in the combat arms MOSs, like 19K tank driver, which is mine. The culture rewards violence, and the war machine continues to run. I'm, I'm sure you're right. I mean, I've never been in the military. I, I see, you know, snippets of it in the news. Um, I have no, I have no idea, and, I, and I've talked to people who have been, and I, I know people who, you know years later have nightmares from their experiences and who, you know, obviously the, the suicide, you know, Angela was talking about this too, the suicide rate for, for veterans is obscene. Um, so obviously, you know, there's, it's, it, it's something very dark and brutal and aggressive and, you know, we only see, as civilians, we only see the tip of that. And, but that's enough for me to oppose it. So um, our military is very Orwellian, I bet. Uh, Sorry, I've only caught the last five minutes here, but to my thinking, educating people on how the Federal Reserve works to hide the true cost of war would be very much striking at the root of the problem. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm sorry if I can't pronounce your name. I have a weird name, too. Nami? Nami? I'm doing horribly with that. I'm sorry. Um, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. If people, and, that's, and I did s say that earlier, if, if people who oppose war 
really understood how the Federal Reserve and how central banking works to hide the true costs of war, and not just hide, but to impose those costs on us. I mean, it's literally sucking the wealth. Okay, thank you, George. It's literally sucking the wealth from what I'll call real society from the rest of us, from, from all of us, and putting it, into, putting it into the war machine. I mean, that's what it does. Does it go other places too? Sure it does. It goes to, you know, congressional benefits and bonuses and, you know, all the, all the junk that government spends money on. But essentially that's, if you were to get rid of the Fed, you would be putting a tremendous dent in the military industrial complex. You'd be putting a tremendous dent in the war machine. And I wish to God that people who oppose war would understand that. Um, okay, uh, four more minutes. Um, uh, do I see any solace in Gary Johnson, who is similar to Ron Paul in political views? You know, I am so apolitical. I just have to. I have to. Um, I, I've seen some things about Gary Johnson that I that I don't care for, and I have to admit, um, you know, he's he's better than most. Um, I have to admit I'm not following him as closely. Um, I'm, not fo I'm actually not following anyone. I'm not following politics at all. I see enough to, to sort of make me nauseous. Um, I guess I see solace that he's there. I think he takes positions, he takes some good positions on things. Um, and it's, it's good that he's there. It's good that there are more people. And Rand Paul, too, who, um, you know, I don't want to badmouth, but is not is not Ron Paul, is not, does not hold all of his principled stances. Um, I'm glad they're there. I'm a long time non-voter. I'm not going to throw my support behind someone unless they're the real deal. And um, I just, I don't see enough, and I guess I should give him more of a, of a, of a fair look. I've, I've, I guess I've seen enough in Gary Johnson to, to make me think he's not the real deal. Um, and, um, yeah, I know that sounds lame, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm a long time no non-voter, as I said. Um, it takes a lot to get me to actually even contemplate going to the polls. And um, I guess I don't have the confidence in him that he would be as committed to, to ending our, to changing our foreign policy. That's kind of what it boils down to. Um, Ah, okay. <laughs> I didn't read your last name, enemy. I didn't, I just saw the enemy, um, enemy of the state. No, that's okay. Um, Kevin being a psychopath in the military is a sure way to be promoted to, to general. Yeah, look at, I mean, Curtis LeMay. I mean, look at what people had to say about him. That guy was just, was a psychopath. I mean, this is, and, and the thing is, this is, if this is being rewarded in the military, what happens to those people when they come home? you know, they're going to be part of our society, they're going to be part of our culture, and that's, you know, that's a broader question. Um, <laughs> Kevin, that's, that's very flattering, thank you. Um, I, you know, it's not that my skin's not tough, he says my skin, my skin may get tougher to deal with politics at, at my age, um, he thinks I'm still a youngin'. Um, it's not that skin toughness, it's that it's the waste of time. I mean, I just, what I've seen is that, is that A, I don't think politics is the answer. I don't think voting in a new bunch of people um, into a system that's broken is the answer. I think if I'm going to spend my time on this, I'm going to spend my time addressing the underlying problem in the system. I'm going to find out what's broken and try to fix that. And I don't think pouring new pe putting new people into the system is going to fix that. Um, which is why I might sound like I'm contradicting myself when I say I support Ron Paul. Um, I, you know, I think I explained myself on that earlier, but I'll just say I don't think that's going to fix the whole problem, but it's going to make such a big difference in terms of saving lives right now that I'm willing to do it. Um, but no, it's, I just, I don't have the time. I don't have time to, to look at all these politicians, you know, 90% of them I know are just playing the game and, and put my energy into that. I think, you know, I've, I've got limited time, limited energy, and I'm going to put it where it's going to have the most impact. That's what I'm trying to do. Government is the problem to us anarchists, absolutely. Okay, Ken, uh, I think this is the last comment and then I've got to go. Let me read what Ken has to say. When I was in basic, every action is watched by the drill sergeants and the army establishment. As an anarchist libertarian in the army, wow, kudos. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> I've seen the whole cost on the vets. 
Most of them don't understand what, that they are pawns for the military industrial complex. Many are alcoholics or drug addicts. Yes, many psychopaths in the military, they are hired killers. Even they have admitted that to me. So, you know, I, I don't know what I have to add to that. Um, yeah, that's... That's a, that's that's sort of the picture. That that's the picture of what we're addressing. That's that's the picture. Thank you, George. I'm leaving right now. Um, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you, George, for setting this up. And I'm going to log out right now.